All set. All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Todd Kobus. I am a city councilor here in Attleboro, and this is the 11th of our weekly COVID-19 video conferences talking about uh, the situation here in Attleboro, what's going on. This week, we have um, Senator Paul Feeney, uh, the state senator, to give a, an update from the state level, as well as Representative Jim Hawkins. We have Jennifer from Project Bread. We have Ken Banacher, the veterans agent here in Attleboro to talk about Memorial Day. Um, we have Steve Withers Jr., the school committee chair to talk, about, um, to talk about what's going on with the schools. And then we have Mrs. Halsey and some, some students to talk about the Special Olympics. So, but before we get started with that, one of the things I'd like to uh, to talk about is contact tracing, and we're working to try to get somebody from Partners in Health to to come on today to talk about contact tracing. Um, we th they weren't available to come today, but we do have a message to talk about what's going on at the federal level um, and, and how the the federal government is working to sort of replicate what we're doing here in Massachusetts at the federal level. So let me share a video here. Hello, Attleboro, and thank you for a chance to pass along this message. To stop the spread of COVID-19, we need to stop people who are infected from spreading the virus to other people. So that's why I'm down here in Washington. I've been working with Congressman Andy Levin of Michigan on a blueprint for a federal contact tracing program that would halt the spread of coronavirus dead in its tracks. Our proposal is modeled on the contact tracing program implemented right here in Massachusetts. It would massively expand our healthcare workforce and make sure that states and localities get the support that they need and provide strong privacy protections to ensure that Americans' personal data and health information is always secure. So here's how it works. Contact tracers identify infected patients, get in touch with close contacts, and explain to those contacts that they may have been exposed and how they can help keep themselves safe and then follow up with them periodically. We know from other countries and from our own history that without contact tracing, we can't defeat COVID-19. But here's the problem. There are only a little over 2,000 contact tracers in the whole United States a country of more than 330 million people. And to make matters worse, 50,000 public health jobs have been lost since the Great Recession, and public health departments simply don't have the resources to hire the people they need. That's why we're proposing a Coronavirus Containment Core, or CCC. Our plan requires that the Center for Disease Control outline a nationwide contact tracing strategy and provide funding that will enable state, local, territorial, and tribal health agencies so that they can staff up and perform this essential work and do it fast. But you see, building the CCC is not just a health strategy. It's a plan to put Americans back to work. Our proposal would connect unemployed Americans with contact tracing employment opportunities and long-term employment once the pandemic is over. If we're serious about stopping this virus and getting our economy back up and running, then we must implement a national contact tracing program as soon as possible. And we must include it in the next relief package that passes Congress. I am proud to partner with all of you in the fight against this pandemic 
and I'm grateful for all that you do at the local level to keep our communities and our loved ones safe. Thank you. Excellent. Um, all right, so hopefully next week we can get somebody to talk, uh, to come on to talk about what we're doing here uh, in Massachusetts. I'll comment, Todd, Todd and I have been working on this yep. for a while. Uh, the, the person, the, the way we got the connection with Partners in Health and their contact is that they called us about somebody in Attleboro. When they called, they also checked the people out and this person had no food had one box of crackers left, crackers left for a very large family. Uh, and then it turns out that they also uh, had been waiting a long time for unemployment. So the Hebron Food Pantry uh, came, came through with some food for the family. Uh, I called them up and got permission. I, I sent in an inquiry to unemployment to see if we could help them with that. So this is, this is a very valuable service. It's an awful lot of people that are suffering and they do more than just call. Uh, so the, thing that is important and senator feeney has said this in the uh, last couple of weeks is you got to answer the phone if, if the phone rings and it's covid uh it's, it's an important call you need to take it excellent thanks jim so next up we have uh state senator paul feeney paul number 11 for us 11 of these my god we still keep going strong um thank you again todd for doing this and for everybody who's on the uh on the panel tonight and Folks who have been jumping in uh, for the last 11, 11 weeks, um, man, Attleboro is uh, is coming together through this crisis, and uh, obviously information is key. And Councilor Colbus, I know you and, and some of your colleagues on the council understand that more than anybody, that we, we really have to communicate as much as possible. <clears throat> Whether it's good news or bad news, people deserve to hear exactly what's going on. So uh, here we are again, number 11, and, you know, as we've followed the, the numbers and the data over the last couple of months uh, have always been clear that, of course, our number one focus through all this uh, has been the public health impact. And the first piece of that was making sure that we managed the surge. <clears throat> I know that became cliche and everybody started hearing about this surge in hospital capacity. Uh, but really, the, the failing that we've seen in other countries across, across the globe uh, was specifically because the hospitals and the healthcare facilities were, were just overrun. Uh, and they didn't have the resources, the staff, or the equipment necessary to try and keep people alive and get them better. So, <clears throat> so that was really goal number one for us uh, here in, in, in Massachusetts was to be able to manage that. We got through that initial surge, and I say initial surge because this virus isn't going away anytime soon, and we have to manage that going forward. So what does that mean? Well, we keep an eye on the data. Uh, certainly the uh, Massachusetts Department of Public Health and the administration uh, do this 24 hours a day, and they're very good about briefing the legislature uh, to make sure that we know uh, the way it's affecting our communities and our districts, um, <clears throat> and, and you know specifically what's going on down to a city and even neighborhood level. So the the DPH has been um, collecting and you know aggregating that data and then doing some analysis with the public health experts. Um, last couple of weeks, we've seen some good trends. Todd, you and I have talked about. You know, the fact that we uh, we kind of managed that surge and plateaued a little bit, uh, which was good from a from a capacity standpoint with the healthcare facilities. But it was still very important to note that they're, you know, although we're doing better with testing here in Massachusetts than in most places across the country, um, you, there's still not enough robust testing going on to be able to truly and effectively understand uh, the spread of this virus and what the are not infection rate number is on this. So. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're still trying to ramp up testing. I know in the last week since we talked last Sunday, there's been more testing sites that have come online. Hopefully people saw in the press that CVS uh, has a, a series of, of testing sites across the Commonwealth where people can go. You can't just show up. You do have to have some sort of um, prior approval. You go onto the website you, or you get a referral from your doctor. Um, but essentially you go up and you, it's a self-administered test. Um, you know, which is, is too gross to get into right now on this call, but uh, it's certainly effective and we want to make sure that we understand where the virus is at. So this week, um, looking at, the, at those trends still, uh, it appears that we're still in a downward trend. Um, but I say that carefully because, you know, this thing tends to kind of go up and down and, and <clears throat> it's a little bit of a roller coaster if you're watching the daily numbers. So 
you know, in addition to watching just the daily raw numbers, which of course, the more testing that's online, uh, the more folks are going to identify that actually have COVID-19. Um, you look at certain other indices. So you look at hospitalization rate, you look at the positive test rate. Um, and, and those numbers are, you know, basically confirming uh, what the public health experts uh, projected, which is that, you know, around this time, we'll start to see a little bit of a decline, uh, hopefully, with all the, the social distancing and mitigating um, experiences that we've had. Uh, and it seems that it's worked, but still hasn't gone anywhere. The hospitalization rates uh, now are at a good level. The last couple of weeks have been coming on with better and better news. Now it's at 3%. Uh, which is good. The um, positive test rate, I think today was about 8%. Uh, it's been hovering around the low teens, which is good. It's, it's down from the high watermark, which is the you know, high 20s, even low 30s um, for day-to-day -day testing. So we're in a good spot with that. Um, but I, I just, you know, anytime I say that, I just really, really, really want to stress caution um, because this is still a deadly, deadly disease that is highly infectious. <clears throat> and really the only reason... Um, the only reason why we've been able to manage this so well is because of everything that everybody's doing and sacrificing so much. Um, so with that, uh, and obviously we continue to monitor that, that, that uh, the data that comes in um, from the, um, from the Department of Public Health, all eyes now are turning to reopening, right? Everybody across the country is starting to say, well, you know, we managed the surge. We, we didn't overwhelm the capacity of the healthcare facilities. When can we reopen and get back? When can I, go back and get my hair cut? When can we go to a restaurant and sit down and have a good dinner, uh, you know, on the weekend with our family? When can we get together and have graduation parties? Um, when can I go to work, right? Everybody's still working from home. When can we get back to business as usual? And I've been careful and, and Representative Hawkins as well in uh, the way we've messaged this, because again, it all depends on the data and the science. And I think that's the appropriate way to do these things. You can't be, you can't manage this through political, you know, partisanship or, or pressure or anything else. It really has to be science-based. Um, that's how you protect the public health. So all eyes now turn to tomorrow, May 18th, which is the date that Governor Baker and his administration announced that there would be some sort of reopening plan. Um, I want to caution again, we're not going to flip a switch and, and reopen the economy. That's not what Governor Baker had intended to do. And certainly as a legislator, one person's opinion uh, I would hope that he wouldn't do that, but really taking a measured approach. So the administration last week announced a four phase reopening approach um, to, the, to, to what we're facing. Um, the first phase will start tomorrow. He will come out tomorrow with some guidance from the reopening advisory board, which has met with industry leaders and folks from all different sectors in the faith community, uh, the education community and nonprofits and businesses across the state to really understand, because this isn't a one size fits all, how you reopen certain industries, how you reopen certain sectors of the economy safely and carefully. So tomorrow's phase, we're gonna go into what they call start. So again, the four phases of the reopening advisory board report, it's gonna mention the start phase, the first phase basically, uh, cautious, vigilant, and then new normal. So start, cautious, vigilant, and new normal. Buzzwords, what do they mean for all of us? Uh, you know, in our communities and, and, you know, folks that are nervous about making sure we can get back to work and open up. So the stock phase, it's going to be announced tomorrow. And again, myself and Rep Hawkins aren't privy to any, you know, any insider information. We're just going by what we've been told uh, from the administration. That's all public knowledge is that tomorrow the report will come out and it'll have a series of guidelines and guidance for certain industries. Now, what can we expect to open right away? You're looking at industries and sectors that don't have a lot of face-to-face -face contact. So when you're talking about light manufacturing, when you're talking about you know, places where people can go to work and maintain a safe distance from each other and not come in face-to-face -face contact with the public, those are the types of industries that you're going to see uh, be able to open right away. Um, <clears throat> you know, other recreational activities where people aren't gathering in big groups, but you, know, you can go and take advantage of some recreational activities or some other places where again, there's limited face-to-face -face contact. Um, in the report tomorrow, there's gonna be uh, specific guidance about those industries that can open up now. As we move into the different phases, and the, the question that I've been getting from all over the city and from all over my district, well, how long is it gonna be between each phase? We just don't know. The administration and the governor told us 
<clears throat> this all depends on what the data shows and what those indices and metrics that we're looking at, what they continue to show. So, you know, it could be a couple of weeks. It could be a month. We just don't know. Uh, and again, it's going to be on a rolling basis as the, as the data uh, comes out each day. So when we look at the start phase, there's going to be limited amount of industries, like I said, that can open. But then there's going to be a series of guidelines that were already announced that are basic foundational level uh, guidance on anybody that reopens what exactly uh, they can do. So if it's possible, Todd, if I could share my screen. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's see. And I love the each week you mentioned that science and data will dictate the timeline, not not any one person. So no, hugely important, yep. hugely important. Um, okay, I'm gonna try and pull this up here. <clears throat> All right, can we see that? We yes. Show? Yep. All right. So. The four phase approach to reopening Massachusetts, like I said, we have the start phase, the cautious phase, the vigilance phase, and the new normal. Uh, just went through that. Now, there's also specific guidelines that are going to be included for each of these phases as we open up. Um, we're going to see that in the report that comes out from the administration tomorrow. And these are mandatory safety standards, which is important to remember. This isn't you know, this isn't something that be in May that, 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 that's going to be in May. This is a shell for anybody that's going to open up. Um, during this period. Now, the key areas for those are mandatory safety standards for workplaces. This is what everybody should be looking at. And if you are a business owner or if you're a consumer or if you um, have an organization that is looking to open up soon, this is what you have to abide by. Social distancing, six feet apart. We've all heard that. Everybody can recite that now. Very important, both inside and outside workplaces, be able to engage in six feet social distancing. Provide signage for safe social distancing. We're already starting to see that at supermarkets, right? Where they have the, the uh, aisles marked out and then they have the registers where, you know, they tell you exactly where you can stand. Require face coverings or masks for all employees. This will continue. The face covering, um, the face covering was very important, that order that came out uh, recently, and that's going to continue as we start to reopen. Second piece is hygiene protocols. What does that mean? You got to make sure that you can have hand washing capabilities throughout the entire workplace um, and ensure that that employees are taking advantage of that and actually going and um, uh, keep it up with with safe hygiene and, and making sure that they're washing their hands and then provide regular sanitation of high touch areas, workstations, equipment, desks, you know, doorknobs, uh, restaurant, rest, restrooms, all sorts of stuff. Now, important to note, I've been engaged in conversations with construction um, uh, personnel throughout the Commonwealth for the last couple of months. You know, imagine working outdoors trying to build a uh, new high school, right, which we know in Attleboro, or, you know, a development downtown Boston. <clears throat> it's difficult sometimes to make sure that they have the proper hand washing stations and, and hygiene stations, but that's something that they're going to have to do uh, going forward for all their workers. Staffing and operations, and what this means is that all those things I just talked about, about hygiene and social distancing, that the employees are trained on that. So if they're going back to work, they know exactly what's expected of them. They know exactly uh, what they need to be doing throughout the day to engage in, in proper hygiene um, and really come up with a plan for anybody that shows any symptoms at all. And this is gonna be critically important that any employee that goes back to work has to be doing self-reporting if they're not feeling well and they shouldn't be in that workplace. Uh, and then cleaning and disinfecting. Um, you know, very important, obviously, we've heard all sorts of anecdotal evidence, and now we're starting to see reports from people that are testing it to see where the coronavirus uh, itself, this novel coronavirus, actually, um, how it behaves in the air with droplets in the air and also on surfaces. So it's critically important that we, that we have safety standards in place, cleaning and disinfecting standards in place, <clears throat> and all sorts of workplaces, especially those that uh, where the public, um, you know, interacts with with employees. So, uh, so those are the four things that are going to be included with any of the businesses that open up as part of this four phase, four phase approach to reopening. Um, so I would look for that, you know, hopefully tomorrow we'll start to see uh, exactly which industries can begin to open and then we'll work our way through the phase. The last piece I want to leave uh, you with on the four phase reopening 
is that the governor and the administration have been clear and us as legislators are making sure that we spread the message to anybody that's going to be opening up that there is a reversion a possible reversion there that if the data and we you know shows and we start to see a spike again and we start to see more of a spread of the infection that we could actually roll back to different phases um i know it's not news that anybody wants to hear but we don't want to get into a situation where you're reinventing the wheel and all of a sudden you know, we're wide open, everything's opened up, the economy's buzzing, <clears throat> and then we have to shut down completely again. So there's gonna, it's a smart approach, I think. They're going to start to look at what the data shows, and then if we have to revert back, we'll revert back. Last piece, Todd, I want to say uh, I had a, a conversation last week with the Restaurant Association uh, and some other um, folks in that industry, in the hospitality industry. Um, obviously, the restaurants are struggling. You know, I think that's probably the one that we've all talked about the most because it was the most clear example of what this economy was doing to certain businesses. A lot of people are suffering, but certainly the restaurant owners are as well. Um, as they begin to open up, there's obviously uh, likely to be some reduced capacity standards um, so that you can maintain that six foot social distancing. Maybe they have to cut the, you know, the amount of, of tables in half in their restaurants. So a lot of them have started to look at outdoor patio service. You know, can we include putting tables out on a sidewalk or out on a patio? Uh, and as you know, as a, as a uh, local official, if a restaurant were to do that, they file an alteration of premises um, uh, application. They come before the licensing authority, which is the city of town. And then that then goes to the ABCC, which is alphabet soup for the uh, Regulatory Control Commission for Alcohol in Massachusetts. The ABCC then could take one, two, three, four months until they get approval for that restaurant. So I filed a bill last week. Um, I think we filed it on Wednesday night, maybe late Wednesday night, um, so we could get it in the pipeline, which would basically cut out some of that regulatory red tape and allow you as a city councilor or the municipality um, to basically issue the license without going through, you know, jumping through hoops for that. So hopefully that'll provide some relief. I know that there's a lot of people looking for that. I want to thank Jack Lank and others at, at the various chambers in my district, um, you know, who are advocating fiercely for their restaurants. Uh, so that's just something that we're doing going forward. Uh, and again, the unemployment issues still keep coming in. So like I do every week, I end with this. If anybody has any issues at all that I can help with, that Rep Hawkins can help with, please, please, please just ask. Certainly any of the city councilors uh, in Attleboro or the mayor know how to get a hold of me. If you want to call me directly, it's 617-722-1222 or send me an email to paul.feeney at masenate.gov. And we'll get right on it and try and help you with your unemployment or your SNAP benefits or whatever you need. So thanks again, Todd. I appreciate the opportunity to be on and stay safe. Thank you, Paul. Um, every week there's just an incredible amount of information um, coming out. So I appreciate you summarizing it. And, and that bill sounds, sounds incredible. It sounds great. So thank you so much. You. Next up, we have Representative Hawkins. Jim. Welcome. Thanks, Todd. Uh, this is number 11. And I have daily uh, Zoom calls with my peers, probably 30, 40, sometimes 50 of my peers every day. And, they're, and every now and then one will boast, oh, we just had this great video conference with people in my district. And I say, yeah, right. We're on our 11th. We've got this guy, Todd Kobus, who busts his hump all week to get panelists. And, and uh, Jim Jones, who's willing to uh, broadcast it over AACS for us, says, uh, we're, we're very lucky in this city. And, and Senator Feeney, and Stephen Withers from the school committee and, and the five of us are on every week. Uh, and I think that's our job. That's what we should be doing. There should be communication. You should hear from us. You should know that we're still there, that we're doing things for you in a very stressful time. Uh, I think it's a great service. And certainly Todd, you've taken the lead on this. So thank you. Uh, I thank also thank Senator Feeney since he goes before me, he, he does all the heavy lifting and describes everything. And I just talk about the fun stuff. So that's all right. I like it like that. Uh, but thank you. Thank you for, uh, uh, for your description of the opening. As, as you know, we've been concerned about that because there's some people weren't sure what was going to happen. Uh, and, and it matters. We can't do this too soon. Uh, the idea that we might have to go back is just horrible. Uh, I, I'm with Senator Feeney. I, I'm certainly on the side of caution. Do this right and then, then we can move on. Uh, another issue that, that I've certainly heard a lot about is uh, funding for the, for the city of Attleboro. And, and through all my peers, since we talk every day, it's across the state. 
and we're, we're becoming an itch and I don't know how the city is going to fund schools, how they're going to fund uh, anything that they're doing without knowing what they're going to get from the state. And we're not, we're not close to even how we're going to, we, we're made, we had formal sessions for two weeks in a row, so we can vote on things. We're having a bill next week that will probably require some debate. So we're going to practice debating without ever being in the house, which is a change of 400 years worth of tradition. But uh, we don't know when, when, when industry will be back in the state. We don't that some of the taxes should have been paid in April were put off to July. We don't know what's coming in the stimulus package. There's just way too much unknown uh, that, that we just don't know. We can't, we can't even, we can't know how to go about it or what will be available for the city. Uh, I think one thought that's been passed out there was a 12th where you would just do a month at a time. But the problem is when we do that, it would have to be based on the 2020 budget. And obviously the 2021 budget would be smaller. So that's kind of a, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of things to, to be concerned about. Uh, we've gotten both Senator Feeney and mine. Oh, I did not, I always forget to give my phone number. Uh, my cell phone is 508 226 1436. And you can reach me any one of a bunch of ways. Senator Feeney's office can reach me, Todd Kobus's office can reach me. Everybody knows my number. But we've been dealing with both, both of our offices with a lot of people that got snagged in unemployment. Probably they never filed for unemployment before filled out the questionnaire wrong or there was some weird combination of jobs. This isn't a normal way for people to leave employment right now. And, and because there's a problem with their claim, they haven't gotten anything yet. Uh, and those take a while to unravel. We can do that. Uh, something new happened this week is they called back and the person that we'd been working for didn't answer the phone. So make sure if, if you're, Make sure, particularly for the COVID calls, for the contact tracing, and if you're waiting for unemployment, make sure your voicemail isn't full. Uh, make sure you answer your phone, because those phone calls are important when they do come. Uh, contact tracing, Todd and I have been trying to get, because uh, we we all feel that this is, a, this is the one thing that's gonna help us climb out of this pandemic, is contact tracing. Uh, the people from Partners in Health that originally contacted Hebron Food Pantry, and then I followed up and I contacted them. They gotta be, I got a voicemail from the guy and I did timestamps. He's, he's calling me at midnight. They're working around the clock. They're, they're really working hard on this. Uh, there was also the possibility of somebody from the state uh, coming on and they're the same way. They're working seven days a week. So we hope we can get more specific information because I think this is something that will make everybody feel better when we when we know more about it and we can hear from more people that are actually doing it to know that this is really happening and, and this is this is going to be a good thing for for getting our way out of the crisis um, something that we're still working on it's a couple of weeks away we don't have dates and specifics yet is uh, we're going to be having another food drive uh, a new we did last time we shared the proceeds which were very generous in the city we got a ton of food. It was split between Hebron Food Pantry, uh, St. Joseph's Food Pantry, uh, St. Teresa's Food Pantry, and Murray Church Food Pantry. And now we have another need is going to be the uh, the summer meals, both both the foods and friends in the evening and the summer meals for kids in the summer. There's some holes in the food accessibility they have, so we're going to need to get food for them also. Uh, some of this is because they haven't had their fundraisers because nobody's having fundraisers unless they're virtual fundraisers. And some of this is disruptions in the supply chain because trucks aren't out as much. Sometimes they might make a trip one way with food and the other way with some other kind of merchandise and they're not making the trip the other way. Uh, so there's a whole lot of reasons there's disruptions with food. And I don't think, and, and at the same time, uh, the food pantries, the, uh, the, the food and friends suppers, the, is they're getting double and even triple the number of people coming that they had before. So this is this is something, and I'm glad Project Red is on to to uh, talk about some some solutions to this. Um, and the only other thing that I'm not the only other thing, but one other one other thing I guess I could mention is there was the uh, evictions bill. People can't be evicted, and people can't have their mortgage foreclosed. And there was a a hole in that that a couple constituents brought to me. If you don't live in the apartment building, you don't get the mortgage protection. So uh, I filed a bill that will protect landlords who have a mortgage. That means it's not a corporation because corporations don't have mortgages. 
So somebody that makes their living by owning a couple, three families would be protected in this. And commercial, uh, I had a store owner who rents a little plaza and one of the other tenants is not paying him because they're not there and he's not protected because it's commercial. And there's also, uh, I, I think about organizations like the, the uh, homeless facility that I'm working on in Attleboro and that relies on rental income from the people who live there. And that's a nonprofit and that would be hurt. So I did file that bill. It got pretty good support from both sides of the aisle. Um, I'm assuming this is gonna be in that we're gonna be in this for a while. I'm hoping, hoping that that goes well. Um, I think that's all. Senator Feeney did all the work. So, so I always appreciate that. Excellent. Thank you, Jim. And I, I love that each week we, we talk about how if somebody needs help to just reach out and ask for help, this is, these are unprecedented times. And um, yeah, there's, there's just don't hesitate to reach out for help. There's a lot of people looking to help and, and, it's, it's great. And so that leads us into uh, Jen in Project Bread. Jen, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Can you tell us a little bit about what Project Bread is? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much for having me, Councillor and, uh, and Representative Hawkins. Um, it's uh, great to be here with all of you. I really appreciate to hearing about some of these updates from from Senator Feeney. So you, 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 um, did, you did offer. I heard you offer, and I, I I think I messaged you like a minute later saying yeah, yes. Yeah, I was like. thrilled that you did. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so um, I'm, my name is Jen Lemmerman. I'm the director of government affairs at Project Bread, and I think um, most people know Project Bread if if they're you know familiar with the organization. It's often through our Walk for Hunger um, that happens every year. That's the uh, Walk for Hunger is actually the oldest um, volunteer pledge based walk in the country. Um, so lots of people from Massachusetts have done it. Um, but we are, um, what the Walk for Hunger is actually supporting is our organization, which is the only statewide anti-hunger organization in Massachusetts. So um, we have sort of a dual track where um, our, our, our mission is ensuring reliable access to food for all residents in Massachusetts. And um, our, our sort of dual approach is around connecting the people who need food today um, with those resources. Um, but while at the same time working to break down the barriers that cause food insecurity in the first place through public policy and advocacy. So, you know, we know that scarcity of food is not what causes food insecurity. There's plenty of food um, for, there's more than enough for, for everyone, um, but it's really unequal access to the necessary resources to gain those food. Uh, that food is where we see those um, inequalities come through. So I'm just gonna take a quick moment to frame up the issue of food insecurity in Massachusetts right now. It's in the news a lot right now because um, it is increasing rapidly in the current situation that um, we're all in. And you know, in before the uh, pandemic and before this crisis, there was already much too much food insecurity in Massachusetts. And most people are surprised to hear the numbers around it. It's one in 11 households and one in nine children are food insecure in Massachusetts on any given day. And that means that they don't have reliable access to food. Um, they do not know that they will always be able to access the nutrition that they need. Um, but there was a study that came out um, at the end of March that was a nationwide survey um, of how people are experiencing food insecurity during the coronavirus pandemic. And it found that 38% of Massachusetts residents are living with food insecurity during this pandemic, um, which is really a staggering number of people. Um, and that's where you're seeing these incredibly long lines at food pantries around the country. Um, and we really expect that that's just going to continue. Um, we're going to see, continue to see social distancing. Um, and also, you know, this, there, there's going to be um, long-term economic impacts and, and that's, you know, food insecurity goes hand in hand with that. Um, so we know that the emergency food system alone uh, cannot and, and really was never meant to respond to a crisis of this magnitude. Um, and just as in normal times, it, it, it is there to fill the gaps um, and we need to be supporting the system to do that. So, um, you know, I know the governor uh, came out with a proposal today to address food insecurity. Um, some might have seen it in the news. We are, we're reviewing it and at Project Bread, but um, we know that it is 
um, heavily focused on the food pantry, um, on supporting food pantries and food banks and making sure that they can get the food out um, to people who need it. And so, um, you know, at Project Bread, we're really focused on the federal nutrition programs that, um, you know, come that are scalable um, programs like SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, which was formerly known as um, Food Stamps. Um, programs like WIC, uh, the Women, Infants, and Children program that provides formula and uh, nutritious food for pregnant women, um, school meals. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about all of these. Um, those are the programs that are going to help shorten those lines at the food pantry. If we can get people on sustainable programs that are scalable and federally funded, um, we can get them out of the food pantry line and um, get them able to purchase what they need for their family. So um, let me go through a few of those programs. Um, I'll do it pretty briefly, but if anybody has any questions, I am really happy to go into a little bit more. So I'll start with school meals. Um, for children who, who qualify for free and reduced price school meals, um, which is both breakfast and lunch at schools, that accounts for about 55% of their calorie intake. And so when schools close suddenly, um, they lost access to that resource. And so the school departments and other um, sponsors like YMCAs and libraries came together. Um, at Project Bread, we have a child nutrition outreach program that partnered with these sites. Um, and within 48 hours, 300 meal sites were set up around the state um, to make sure that these kids were going to be able to get the food that they need while schools were closed. There are now over 1,500 around the state. And these uh, meal sites, they're for anyone um, ages zero to 18. You don't have to apply, you don't have to sign up. Um, you can go to these sites and you can get nutritious food uh, for your children. There's no documentation required. So um, this has all been done through various USDA waivers. So the USDA is the, the federal agency. Um, and so they have um, created these flexibilities so that in a time of social distancing, families are able to do um, grab and go, drive through pickup um, and access the meals that they need. I know in Attleboro, there's at least three sites um, at the high school, at the United Methodist Church and at the Baptist Church where people can go and, and pick up meals during this time. The other program which I touched on was is SNAP. Um, SNAP is the most effective anti-hunger program in the nation. Um, data has shown that it is effective at not only allowing people to access the food that they need, but it also lifts people out of poverty. Um, so it's an incredibly important program that we need to make sure that everybody who is eligible and interested is signed up for this program. And that is something that Project Bread's food source hotline is uh, dedicated to. The food source hotline is a um, confidential, um, full, full assistance uh, hotline that anyone can call and uh, we can screen them for SNAP. We can walk them 99% of the way through the application process. They just kind of have to hit send and do the last part um, and is really focused on making sure that we're getting people signed up for um, uh, the purchasing power that allows them to go to the grocery store and buy the food that they need for their families. Um, there has been an enormous increase. Um, we have seen a 350% increase in call volume to the food source hotline. We've hired seven new people um, to answer the phones. DTA is reporting a quadrupling um, of their um, applications. DTA is the Department of Transitional Assistance, which is the state program um, that administers SNAP. And so, you know, we just know, we know that there is just a massive increase in need right now um, and wanting to just make sure um, that we are getting people the resources to get onto that program. Um, and then just very quickly, one more program that I wanted to highlight um, because I think, you know, people may be, um, may be hearing about this um, and, and might be confused about what it is, which is pandemic EBT. So pandemic EBT, it's a national, it's a federal program, and it's a food benefit that allows families to buy food at the grocery store while schools are closed. So any student who had access to free or reduced price meals while they were in school um, will receive this cash benefit. If they're already on SNAP, it will just be added to their EBT card. If they are not on SNAP, they will receive a card in the mail. It looks like a debit card. And that's where we're really trying to get the word out because 
people might not know what it is and they might get this card in the mail that they weren't expecting and just toss it thinking that it's, you know, spam mail. Um, so anybody can call the food source hotline um, and, you know, find out if they should be expecting that or if they get it and have questions, we can certainly answer those questions. But it's, you know, any school age child who would normally have gotten a free or reduced price meal while they were at school will get this pandemic EBT um, benefit to go and, and purchase food since they won't be receiving it at school. So that's a very quick rundown of the federal nutrition programs that we're focused on at, at Project Bread. Um, you know, we, as I mentioned, you know, between the Food Source Hotline and our Child Nutrition Outreach, Outreach Program, we're doing that very direct hands-on service with people. Um, and then m myself as the, the Government Affairs Director, um, we're also working hand-in-hand -hand with the um, agencies and with the legislature, like Representative Hawkins and Senator Feeney, um, as they're working really hard to respond to this crisis and to um, boost up the programs that are going to help people. So um, I did, I think, Councillor Cobus, do you have the, the web page? Um, if you're able to put that up, it's projectbread.org slash COVID-19. Um, anybody can go here. And it gives you all of the resources, or the rundown of everything that I just talked about and all of the resources that might be available to you. Um, as you scroll, continue to scroll down, there's a very helpful map right there. Um, and that you can find all of the meal sites that are near you um, that you might be able to take advantage of. And then at the very bottom of the page, um, that tells you a little bit about pandemic EBT the nearest food pantries, but the food source hotline is what I would highlight. Um, anybody can use it, 1-800-645-8333, completely confidential, um, available in 160 languages, oh, anybody sorry, can sorry. call. Um, the yep, right up there. So uh, Councillor Cobus did team me up to kind of give uh, some ideas for any action steps that people can take if you're looking to get involved. I would I would mention three. Um, I think that they are, you know, first and foremost, foremost it's a little bit self-serving, but join our action team. We have a grassroots advocacy team of people who are amazing and they, they get our action alerts in their email. Um, they join me to raise up this issue with elected officials on all levels. We do work with um, locals sometimes. So people like Councillor Cobus, lots of times it's the state legislator, legislature, um, like Representative Hawkins and Senator Feeney, and, and also on, even on the federal level. Um, so we heard from um, from Senator Warren earlier, and she's she's gotten our, our letters as well. So um, we make it really easy. We try to make it fun. So join me um, by joining the action team. Walk, do the Walk for Hunger with us. Um, we actually just had our Walk for Hunger. It was our first ever virtual event. We weren't really sure how that would go, but obviously that was the choice that we had and it went great. We had a ton of fun. Um, I know uh, Representative Hawkins um, supported that and we support. We thank him. And um, he actually was also at physically at the walk the year before, which was wonderful. Um, so join the Walk for Hunger. We'll see what it looks like next year, but we're gonna be doing it no matter what. And then um, spread the word about the meal sites. Um, if you know anybody who has school-aged kid, um, anybody can go, and and it's you know it, it actually helps. They get um, their re their federal reimbursement um, is is um, contingent upon participation, and so you know some people feel like, well, I don't really need that. Um, it's it's something that is open to everyone. So spread the word um, and and uh, take advantage of that opportunity. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jen. Uh, yep. That was great. Next up, we have Ken Badiger, the veterans agent here in Attleboro, to talk about um, what Memorial Day is going to look like this year. Is it going to be the same as last last year? Or, no? <laughs> no, not at all, actually. <laughs> and uh, so that, that's quite an act to follow. Thank you for all the hard work that you're doing, uh, Jen, over at Project Bread. And thank you, Councillor Cobus. Uh, this is a heck of an agenda, and it's an honor to have a seat at this table. So um, 11 of these meetings, uh, putting them all together, you make it look easy. And so hats off to you, because I know this is not easy. Uh, it's something like herding cats, getting everybody on the same sheet of music. Um, and, uh, and thank you also to Senator Feeney and to Representative Hawkins for the tireless work that you do on behalf of our district up in the legislature. Um, Jen has inspired me a little bit to uh, share a little bit more information about what we're doing uh, to help veterans because the Veteran Services Office throughout all of this is still open. 
uh, we're still taking phone calls, we're still taking emails, and we're still helping out veterans in our community who are impacted by COVID-19 and are otherwise uh, just uh, in need. And so that, that comes in a lot of different forms. There's uh, food resources that are available. Jen touched on a lot of that. One piece of information that is veteran specific uh, that wouldn't be covered by Project Bread is the uh, food distribution happening through the Massachusetts Military Support Foundation. Uh, the nearest, there, there's sites all over the state. I believe that there's 10. Uh, I, I could be wrong on that. There could be 12. I think it's 10. Uh, the nearest one to Attleboro is in Foxborough. There's also one in Fall River. And uh, the deal is you just prove that you're a veteran and you set an appointment, you show up and uh, they'll give you a box of food. It's supposed to be uh, uh, two weeks worth of food for two people. Uh, and so they'll just, uh, you, you drive up, they load it up into your trunk and they, they give you the salute and they send you on your way. So it's a really great resource uh, for veterans and I've made a number of referrals, uh, both to the Hebron Food Pantry and some of the other uh, food outlets here locally in the city of Attleboro, but then also I'm sending uh, some of our veterans up to take advantage of that. So if veterans are interested in uh, partaking of the Massachusetts Military Support Foundation, that food distribution, it's food for vets, they can just check out the website and book that appointment. It's mmsfi.org. Uh, That's Mike, Mike, Sierra, Fox, India.org uh, for those veterans in the group. So uh, check that out. And the one up in Foxborough is open on Mondays and Wednesdays, 10 to 2. Uh, you just got to make that appointment and go. Um, the other piece of the puzzle is that income insecurity piece that uh, uh, Jen touched on as well. And uh, one of the best uh, projects that the state of Massachusetts undertakes, and really the reason that we get to boast that we lead the nation in the delivery of benefits and services to veterans, is the Chapter 115 financial aid program. Frankly, it's the reason that I have a job, and it's the reason that there's a guy or a gal like me that serves every city and town in Massachusetts. And veterans uh, in need in our community can reach out to the Veteran Services Office and um, we can work with you to get you direct financial aid. Uh, the target income level is 200% of the federal poverty level or lower. Uh, so for a one person household, just a single veteran, uh, that could be uh, a little bit over $2,000 a month or less and you qualify for the program. For a family like mine, a household of four, uh, those income figures go up pretty dramatically. So it's worth reaching out uh, and, and having a, that conversation about what can the state, uh, what can the state and the city do uh, in the way of financial aid to help you out. And um, the state has taken over 12,000 applications for financial aid since the, um, since the emergency declaration in March regarding COVID-19. And um, it's really been a great thing to see uh, our veterans getting the help that they need when they need it most. Um, the, the scary part about that is that we don't expect that we're reaching all of the veterans, one, who are eligible, uh, or two, uh, will become eligible because we're sort of bracing for impact right now. We think that uh, unemployment is really sort of uh, carrying a lot of our veterans over while they're furloughed or while their uh, workplaces are closed, uh, but unemployment doesn't last forever. And uh, once that expires, I want veterans to know that they can turn to us and we can absolutely be that safety net and, and help them out. Um, but to shift it back to the agenda, sorry for uh, going off on the uh, on the tangent there. I just think that it's really important to spread the word. Uh, no, no, sure that's, people... that's great, Ken. I appreciate it. And I appreciate all the work you do. Yes, go ahead. Um, so right. Memorial Day, uh, just, just like we're having these Zoom calls here and I'm not standing before the city council delivering uh, this same sort of message, uh, COVID-19 has impacted a great uh, many facets of our lives. And uh, it'll, it'll absolutely be impacting the way that we uh, honor and remember our service members this year for Memorial Day. Um, typically in Attleboro, we'll have a big parade. It's something that I'm really proud of and it's one of the high points of my year. Uh, this year, it would, be, it would be unwise to try to host a parade and put that many people together all in the same place. So we are uh, canceling the Memorial Day parade regardless of whether or not the state is opened uh, by Memorial Day as, we're, as you know, we're starting to open back up. Uh, the other piece of the puzzle is that uh, Memorial Day for the veterans in our community uh, tends not to just be one parade and one ceremony. We tend to go to a variety of different uh, memorials throughout the city and uh, we pay homage to the original tradition that was uh, to visit all of the cemeteries and decorate the cemeteries and, and visit all of our memorials. And most of those ceremonies are also canceled. Uh, usually the Memorial Day weekend uh, would look something to the tune of uh, six or seven different ceremonies at various sites throughout the city. And having that many people gathered all together 
all at once uh, with the public health risk that we're facing right now just doesn't make sense to us. So um, there's one that I'm going to be hanging on to. Um, that's the uh, hillside ceremony, uh, the sunrise ceremony over at the hillside cemetery. Um, that usually happens the day before Memorial Day. We're going to be doing that with a small gathering of veterans. Uh, the public is not invited. I've, I've let our elected officials know uh, that it's happening. Uh, you're not encouraged to attend. It's really just going to be a small uh, ceremony just to keep the tradition alive, uh, just to say that we, you know, this ceremony is unbroken and we continue to do it. And so it's just going to be a small gathering. I'm going to say a few words. Some of the commanders of the veterans posts uh, local to Attleboro, the American Legion, the VFW, and the DAV. Uh, they'll be there and they'll say a few words as well. Um, but beyond that, it's not going to be the big thing that it usually is. Um, the other tradition that it's really heartbreaking that we're going to see uh, suspended, at least Real for quick, this year. Ken, with Go the, ahead. the ceremony at Hillside Cemetery, will that be broadcast on double ACS? So I've invited uh, Jim Jones to bring a cameraman down. Uh, I don't know whether that's going to be broadcast live. However, I do expect that it will be filmed and shared with the community. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Um, so the other uh, tradition that we usually have, uh, since I've been a veterans agent, we've uh, put over 7,000, 7,216, I think I got that number right, uh, is the number of veterans who are listed on the uh, Attleboro Honor Roll at the Veterans Memorial Common in downtown Attleboro. That's those five obelisks that say World War I, World War II, all the way up through Vietnam. And those are all of Attleboro's veterans who served in those various wars. And uh, for Memorial Day, we've typically put a flag out on that field, uh, one for each one of those veterans listed on the memorial there. The problem uh, with doing that again this year is that those flags are stored in a basement at a building nearby City Hall and one to unpack them is uh, laborious and typically we'll have a team of at least 10 volunteers working belly to belly to try to get those up and out of the basement. And then to deploy that field of flags also takes at least 20, feet, uh, 20 volunteers, uh, usually working in uh, close concert to establish the neat rows that we usually uh, will put out there on the common. So it didn't, again, it didn't make sense uh, respecting the health and safety of our volunteers uh, who make that happen. Um, we are going to honor our, uh, our veterans. Um, I've commissioned an oversized wreath uh, for us to display there instead, and I think that that'll be a nice tribute. Uh, the other thing that we're doing for Memorial Day is that we're going virtual, a lot like we're doing a Zoom meeting right now. I've invited the folks who would normally speak at a Memorial Day ceremony uh, to come on down, and Jim Jones over at AACS and his team are going to be filming uh, those elected officials and uh, those community leaders uh, at the Veterans Memorial Triangle, and they'll be putting together a nice presentation uh, to broadcast to the community for Memorial Day. So we're going virtual uh, on that one. And that's that's really kind of the Memorial Day update. And again, I just wanted to re uh, remind veterans in our community, especially uh, that if you're in need uh, in this time of uh, this unprecedented time, as, as we always say, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, we've got resources available and I do uh, I do wanna help out folks. Excellent. Thank you, Ken. Thank you very uh, much for having me. Next up, we have Steve Withers Jr. And uh, Steve, welcome. I, this is the, like we said, the 11th of these to start off as you and I as Ward 3 office hours. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, thank you so much for joining and happy to see you back and feeling better. So welcome. Uh, do thank you. Want to you. Provide an update for the, the public schools? Yeah, I'm happy to. Thank you, Todd, again, for putting this together this week, as you have every week for the past 11. Um, does, it's crazy that it's been 11 weeks since that first, uh, I, don't, I think it was a Friday night in, in my office when we did the first one of these as an update to Ward 3. But uh, thank you very much for everything you've done to put these together. Um, luckily for uh, the community and everyone watching, uh, once again, I, I don't have uh, much to say for the Iowa Public Schools. This is much more uh, exciting update from uh, our teachers and our students that I'll get to in a minute. But um, what I will say is that we do have a school committee meeting tomorrow night. Uh, a lot of people are asking about graduation. That's kind of the, a big thing on people's mind as we get, we're at that time of the year. Um, we do on the agenda have an, um, an agenda item for the principal to uh, make a proposal for a couple ideas for graduation. Um, I do not know what those are, uh, to be honest, but um, you know, I do expect that we'll be voting on something tomorrow night for 
for the community. So hopefully in the next few days, we'll have something um, that everyone can look forward to as a, as a way to celebrate our seniors um, as kind of the, the big, uh, big event for our school district of the year. Um, otherwise, everything is pretty much status quo. We're as much a well-oiled machine as we can be in these different times of uh, remote learning, getting uh, you know students their their assignments every every weekend, and they're meeting with their teachers, getting their assignments in. Um, I I want to thank the parents, the students, the teachers for everyone for putting their time in. Um, it's it's hard on everyone. It's a lot of work, but everyone is really doing a, a good job and making you know the most out of what is a a unique situation for everyone. So uh, thank you to, to all the families out there for, for, for making the effort because it is important for the students. Um, the last couple of weeks of the year, school ends on June 19th, the last couple of weeks will be focused on um, getting Chromebooks back from families that we've loaned them to. And also um, something that I didn't realize, even though I have two, two students in the district is uh, a lot of students still have belongings in the schools. And so, um, there will be updates coming uh, to families in the next couple of weeks about um, scheduling students coming in to get their belongings that they left in their desks at the elementary school level, in their lockers at the middle school level, at high school level. Um, so that's not something that's been forgotten by the administration, it's something that's being worked on right now. So it's just something to, to keep your ears open for because that is that is coming and something that we expect to, to have done for everyone in June. Other than that, um, it's, you know, an, Another couple of weeks left in May, uh, which are important weeks in the school calendar uh, in learning, and so we're gonna we're gonna continue to plow ahead and, and hopefully uh, do as much as we can for students to uh, to not only enrich themselves but also to, to move forward. And that's that's kind of what we're looking at right now. So before I turn it over to the main event for the schools um, and the Special Olympics, any questions or concerns for for me? I don't have any. Anybody else? Perfect. Good. Perfect. All right. For that, then, um, you know, one of the one of the big events we have each year at the high school uh, is a Special Olympics. It's the big event for the high school for the city of Attleboro. Um, obviously, like many things in our community and in the country and the world as a whole, um, that's kind of been put put on the side. So. Um, we have uh, Ms. Halsey and some students to, to talk about what we're doing this year. And uh, for that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Halsey to, to take it over. You're on mute. I knew it was gonna happen. Thank you. That's what you told me. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Now you can hear me. Um, so I'm Becky Halsey. I've been volunteering with the Attleboro Area Special Olympic School Day Games since 2004. Um, the event actually started in 1987. It was started by Bob Haggerty, who was an AHS teacher. And he got together with other AHS teachers and service organizations, the Rotary, as well as the Elks. He's like, we need to plan this event for our athletes. Because back in 1987, they really didn't have that many opportunities to um, compete in any in any way in the city. So he started it. Um, it's been going on for 32 years. Uh, for the first 17 years, the event um, was coordinated by adults. And that's it. Like the adults at the school coordinated the event. They did all the registration pieces. And then when they asked me to get volunteers for it in 2004, I was like, students could definitely leave this event. So the school year 2004 to 2005 was the first year that it became a student-led event with student coordinators for every aspect of the games. Um, and so it's been running as a student run event for 16 years. And this year we're celebrating the 10th year of Project Unite. And a couple of the coordinators are here and the former coordinator, and they're gonna talk about what Project Unite is and how cool it is. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Olivia first. Um, she's gonna talk about how special the event is for the city. Um, and then we're gonna go through and just talk about how we didn't want this year to pass without um, celebrating our athletes in a way to get together for 
virtually. And so, so that's what we're going to discuss. So Olivia, you're up. All right. So hi, guys. Um, I'm Olivia. Um, I have been involved with Special Olympics for so long. Well, at least my family has. Uh, my brother's been an athlete in the games for years after years after years. And he enjoys it so much. And he always looks forward to it. Um, he's always talking about it. I remember when I was younger, um, he'd come home with a medal every year and it made me so happy. So when I uh, came to the high school, I noticed that there's this um, coordinator thing <laughs> to help um, put together Special Olympics. And I took the opportunity to join and it means so much to me that I can help um, make this happen for all the athletes because I know how much my brother loves it. So being able to... Um, participate and help out is just amazing. And I bet the other coordinators feel the same way. Thank you. Um, thanks, Olivia. Sarah, you're up. So a little thing about Sarah. So Sarah Faulkner is a math teacher, a uh, swim coach, and all these wonderful things at the high school. She's also a Project Unite advisor. Um, but Sarah is also one of the first students um, who was a student coordinator back when she was a junior at AHS. Uh, and so I was super excited when she got hired uh, about like five years ago, six years, five years, um, to come back to the high school. And now we get to co code. Well, we have lots of advisors, actually, um, but we get to work together again. So Sarah, you're up. Um, yeah. So typically in the spring, coaches and teachers at different schools are you know, kind of gathering what athletes are going to be doing, you know, what events and uh, registering them and practicing. Obviously, being out of school, that really didn't happen. Um, um, also, this March, Special Olympics Massachusetts canceled most of their state events and kind of left school day games up to the individual schools um, and universities to kind of see if and how they would want to run them. Um, every other program canceled, but the Attleboro School Day Games never canceled. Uh, we always kind of had hope that our, our event is so strong and so popular in our community and in surrounding communities that uh, we knew that, you know, we could keep the spirit alive and do a virtual event. Okay, well, cool. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so Eleanor's up. She's going to talk about how many um, how many athletes and how many cities around us uh, participate in the day games, and then also talk to um, what our goal is this year in celebrating the tenth anniversary of Project Unite, and how many people we want to register for this event. So I'm Eleanor. I'm a the registration coordinator for Project Unite. Um, I have been for the past two years. And last year we had 850 athletes um, register for the day games. And we had about, we had probably over a thousand people at the event with coaches, parents, volunteers, you know, everyone coming there for the spirit of Special Olympics. But our goal for this year is to reach 10,000. Um, and the People who can participate in the event this year, um, it's anyone. It's uh, people who are normally athletes, people who are normally volunteers, community members, coaches, anyone can participate. Um, so we have the uh, registration link up on our website, but it's not, it's op totally optional to register. Um, and the towns around us, so we have people from Mansfield, we have people from um, I don't know the list off the top of my head, but Foxborough, um, Sharon, all the surrounding towns, but we hope to expand it um, for this day games at least, and hopefully into next year. But um, all around the state, as Ms. Faulkner said, um, people can participate in the state games. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's it. <laughs> okay, so um, next up we have Caroline. Uh, who's going to talk a little bit more about Project Unite uh, and how it works. Yeah, we haven't talked about Project Unite yet. So Caroline, you're up. You have to unmute yourself though. Okay, here we go. 
Hi, so I am Caroline. I actually graduated Bishop Fian. Um, I was in the class of 2019. So what Project Unite is, it is three schools. So it is Bishop Fian High School, North Attleboro High School, and Attleboro High School. And we, the three high schools can work together in order to make the day games, out of our day games. So um, I, at Fian, we don't have anything like we don't have best buddies or play unified. So it's really great for us to be able to join with other schools to work and to make something as great as the day games. So do you want me to talk kind of about what it is? So basically uh, the students, we're, the students run the program with the help of our advisors. So all of us are assigned different jobs and it's really up to us to come together and utilize all of our skills to make the day games run smoothly. Hey Caroline, what did you do? Like what was your coordinator position last year? So I was the young athletes competition coordinator. So I helped oversee, we have two events kind of going at once. We have young athletes, which is I think K through third grade is that right yep k through third grade i'm a little rusty so k through third grade and then we have all of the older kids also doing their own day games so we kind of have our own mini little day games going on in another field so i just helped run that helped make the games the rotations all of those fun things what kind of so what's cool about young athletes and the fact that you're here is that the types of activities that go on at young athletes is a lot different um, than our typical track and field uh, meet. And so can you just like talk a little bit, just give us a couple of different activities you had last year at Young Athletes. Yeah. So it's more of like a field day, I would say, to describe it. And we have different rotations. So like one station's an obstacle course and you go to a relay race and you have like freeze dance. So it's a bunch of mini little field day games and activities. Yeah, that's perfect. Cool. Thank you so much. Okay, Ari, so you're up. Hi, I'm Ari Susi. Um, I graduated out of our high school in 2018. Um, I was a coordinator for Special Olympics. Um, I think I'm talking about the resilience of the program and how they fight through anything. Like, for example, we had 150 volunteers and people that wanted to plunge to raise money for Special Olympics with our like yearly plunge. And you know, 150 got too much. We were too big for the beach. So then what do we do? We throw a pool in the parking lot and we plunge there because nothing's going to stop Project Unite and everything that it stands for and making sure that that day is the best day possible for those kids and everybody involved. Um, so a pandemic wasn't going to stop them. And so now it's going to be online. It's going to be awesome. And this group is just amazing. And it's been awesome to work with them. And yeah, so... Cool. Thanks, Ari. And Ari, it, what cool thing about um, when you're a volunteer uh, for the day games as a student, oftentimes students will graduate and then they will call us up in May or in April. They're like, I want to come back. And so we have a huge um, community volunteer um, base, I guess. Like we have a lot of community volunteers, almost to the point where um, we have to turn people away. Um, because at the event, we want everyone to have a job. We want them to have a great experience. Um, but if there's too many people doing one job, then that doesn't work out. So the cool thing about our event this year, which we haven't actually told us, told you when it is. So it's on June 3rd. Um, so in about two and a half weeks, uh, it's Wednesday, June 3rd. And we picked that date because it is before the state games. So after Special Olympics Massachusetts canceled their state games, they're like, you know what? We want to do something virtually. And so they're actually having athletes post, um, record times and submit their videos to the state. And then they're going to be creating a video and showing it on the date that would have been the state games. So that would have been on the 12th and 13th. Uh, and so they're actually doing that. So that's cool. So like, when you register for our event, you can actually submit your, if you want to practice and submit videos by the 26th of May, then you could also be at the state games. So it's two for one. Um, so we have, like, we have a website. It's AtterboroSpecialOlympics.org. Um, all the information about our event uh, is on that website. Um, the registration is super easy. 
you can register your whole family on one registration. And there's only three questions that are mandatory. And the other ones are just like, you know, the fun ones, like, where do you live? Just to see how far we get across the country. Um, because there are coordinators, there are volunteers who volunteered 20 years ago who might live, you know, in California or Wyoming or Iowa. That'd be cool. Um, so we want to see how many people we can reach out to and get to participate because 32 years of an event happening in our city is definitely something to celebrate. Um, and because we can't all be together, um, nor would all those people fit in one place, like even if we could get together, um, but we do want to see um, and actually make this kind of a yearly tradition that when the day games is happening, that we can have this virtual event where people can support our athletes all over. That's pretty much it. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Ms. Salzi and Ari and Caroline and Eleanor and Olivia and everyone. Thank you so much for, for everything you do. Um, yeah, it, it's Ms. Faulkner. Um, thank you, sorry. Um, Th that's great. So that uh, concludes everything for tonight. Does anybody have anything additional to add? Oh, Ms. Salzy, go ahead. Sorry, I have one more thing. So um, a couple of years ago, we, uh, our first responders have always been a supporter of Special Olympics. Um, police officers and firefighters have been giving out awards to our athletes. It's kind of a tradition uh, that they come for the parade and then they stay for the day. Uh, and we also have a partnership with Special Olympics, the Law Enforcement Torch Run, which is actually like the sweatshirt that I'm wearing. Um, and retired Chief of Police Rick Pierce um, is really active in LTR. And the school resource officer at North Attleboro High School, who is Chris Crossman, she's a police officer in North Attleboro. Um, she's actually our other Project Unite advisor for North Attleboro. But we have a huge um, support from our first responders as well. And so when you register for the event, there's lots of different options and be like, where do you fit in, in terms of how you're connected, um, whether you're an athlete, a unified partner, a first responder. Um, we're just trying to get all of that data in terms of who you are and how you fit into our story. Perfect, thank you so much. Anything else before we wrap it up? Todd, I, I just want to thank uh, thank you for that last presentation, Miss Alzi and Miss Faulkner and uh, Olivia, Eleanor, Ari, Caroline. That was amazing. I want to say that there is somebody from Norton, Todd. Yes. Uh, we all know yes. who has been uh, on these calls now for the last two and a half months. And after we go and, and have these presentations, he then uh, posts on social media the recap so that everybody in the area can see that. And that is none other than the honorary mayor of Norton, Peter J. Wiggins, who everybody knows. Uh, and I want to give him a shout out because he did hit up our chat just now saying that he was an athlete in the Special Olympics Day Games, uh, back coached by Don Arruda back in the day. He competed in the dash and softball run, and he got a ton of medals. So big shout out from Alabama to the honorary mayor of Norton, Peter J. Wiggins. Great job, and keep wearing those medals, Peter. Excellent. You're registering this, this year too, which would be great. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So I think that wraps it up for the night. Thank you so much, everybody. We'll see you next week.